Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, so in the last class, we were talking about stacks. We made an interface for stacks. Um, and I noticed that when we were in the lecture slides that I showed you in the previous class, uh, they mentioned something about array-based stack. Um, and we actually, we actually haven't seen an array-based stack yet. Uh, so I have to go back, um, and I actually grabbed the correct lecture, which actually talks about the array-based stack. So I'll go back and talk about those today. So we're going back uh, a little bit in time. Uh, so one of the things you can do with a stack is that you can, uh, or, uh, you can use it to convert a recursive method uh, to a non-recursive method. Um, there's important reasons for wanting to do this sort of thing. Um, and so the way that recursive methods work on, in most programming languages, um, they work in such a way that there's a limited size of problem that you can solve because every recursive method needs its own space to run. So if you try to solve a very large problem, you eventually run out of space or enough memory uh, to run the method. Um, so um, it's often ad advantageous uh, to convert the recursive method to an iterative one. Um, now, the key to doing this lies in uh, understanding how recursive uh, functions or methods um, work. Okay, so here's a silly little recursive method. You would never write this method, probably, um, in real life. This simply computes uh, x raised to the power 10. Right? Um, sorry, x raised, sorry, 10 raised to uh, the power n, sorry. Right? So this computes like 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and so on and so on and so forth, right, for some appropriate value of n. And it's implemented recursively, which you would never do. Right? Uh, okay, so the way this works is we have a base case. Right? So if n is zero, we know the answer is one. Right. Uh, if uh, n is any other value, uh, larger than, uh, larger, so any other non-negative value, uh, you can simply compute the result as 10 times the next lower power of n, right? Uh, or times, yeah, times 10 raised to the next lower power of n, right? And so we know how to compute 10 to the n. We just call our method here. So to compute the next lower power of n, well, we can recursively call the method with n minus 1. So when you run this method, what actually happens in memory is the following. Uh, so I'm gonna call it with the uh, argument three. So I wanna compute 1,000. So somewhere in the main method, we call the power of 10 method. So this method shows up somewhere in memory. What memory do you need to compute power of 10? So the variables that show up in memory are all the variables that show up in the method itself, including the parameters. So the parameter n, it needs space in memory. The value result or the variable result needs space in memory. Uh, if you have any other variables or parameters in the method, they would need space in memory. So they all show up over here with the uh, power of 10 method. And so in power of 10, the value of n is three, we're not in the base case, and so we end up in the recursive call where the result is 10 times power of 10, two, right? Or 10 times 100. Okay, so when you call the recursive method, guess what happens? another version of the method shows up somewhere in memory. Uh, this time, this version of power of 10 runs with a value of n equals to two, which is not a base case. So we end up in another recursive call. Uh, in the recursive call, another version of power of 10 shows up in memory. Right? So this third version of power of 10 now shows up. We have n equal to one, right? Which is not the base case. So yet another version of power of 10 shows up in memory. Right, we now end up with n equals zero, which is the base case, and we now know the answer. Right, so we now can set result, the result is one. Right, and so notice that to compute the power of 10 raised to the power of three, we actually needed four instances of the power of 10 method. Uh, and this is exactly how recursion works, um, at least in the C-like languages. Right, every version of the method or function shows up, uh, requires its own little chunk of memory. Right, each recursive call results in a new instance of the, uh, func of the method running. Okay, so once we have the value one, we can now return that value back to its caller, which was the previous version of power of 10. So the one goes back to the result, right? And now this method is done, right? It's returned its result, so whatever memory and other resources this method was using up can now go away. So that method now goes away, right? We have the result of 10 here now. So this 10 can go back to the caller. So there it goes. 
once the value gets returned, this version of power of 10 can go away, right? And we now have the result of 100. That result can then be returned back to the caller. So there it goes, right? And then the second version of power of 10 can go away. Right? We've now computed the result of 1,000, which can now be returned back to the caller. Right? And now that this method is done and returned its value, it can go away. Right? And so notice what the calls the power of 10 look like. Right? They look like a stack, right? Where the stack, where the top of the stack is actually at the bottom. Right? So you push four instances of power of 10 onto a stack, and as they finish their work, they get popped off the stack from the bottom, right? That's that stack. Right. And so the, um, uh, the fact that the methods look like they are being pushed onto some kind of stack is in fact how it actually works in, uh, on your computer. They get pushed onto what's called the call stack, right? So your Java virtual machine, when it calls a recursive method, has a uh, call stack in it, right? Every time you call a method, that method gets pushed onto the call stack. Every time the method finishes, it gets popped off the call stack. Uh, and so uh, the reason why uh, the, you are limited in solving, uh, you're limited in the size of the problems that you can solve using recursion is that the memory that's reserved for the call stack is relatively small, right? Even if your computer has eight gigabytes of memory on it, the call stack in the virtual machine is much, much smaller than that. Uh, so there's a limited number of uh, concurrent running methods that you can have uh, at any one time. Um, so if you don't have access, so if the call stack has a relatively small amount of memory, um, you want to, and you want to solve a large problem, then what you want to do is you want to exploit the fact that your computer has much more memory uh, and use that memory to actually do the computation. So what you have to do is you create your own stack class and you simulate what the virtual machine is doing, right? So whatever information we're pushing onto the call stack, we have to sort of simulate that um, using our own stack, right? So in general, this isn't so easy to do, but in this particular case, it's not so bad. Okay, so in power of 10, what do you need to do every time a recursive call returns, right? So if you go back and look at the, um, the actual implementation of the method, so when it returns, uh, we're uh, storing uh, some value of power of 10. Oh, sorry. Back, oh, too far. Okay, and this looks good. Right, so every time a power of 10 uh, method returns its value, right, um, doo -doo -doo -doo, you want to multiply the value that is returned by the recursive call by 10. Right, we compute 10 times the previous uh, version of power of 10. So when we, of the smaller version, uh, the smaller, uh, the next smaller version of power of 10. Right, so when that version returns, we multiply it by 10. Right, so that's one, right? So if we wanna simulate what the Java virtual machine is doing during each recursive call, right, we can remember how many times do we need to multiply by 10. Right, how do you do that? Well, you push a 10 onto a little local stack. So every recursive call that's not the base case pushes a 10 onto a um, stack. Okay, so during each recursive call, what happens to the value of n? Well, n controls the, n is the exponent that you're raising 10 to, right? Each time we uh, call the recursive method, each time we recursively call the method, the value of n goes down by one. Okay, so that's two. Oh, sorry. Right, so in code, if you wanted to start to simulate uh, what the stack is actually doing, or what the call stack is doing, one way that you could do it is to make a stack of integers. Uh, this should, oh yes, I guess I changed this to int. That's fine. So uh, the previous slide multiplied, computed as a double. Here I'm doing it as an int. So I'm gonna make a stack of integer, and it's empty to begin with, right? I now wanna simulate the recursive calls. Right? So as long as n is greater than zero, a recursive call will happen, right? Each time a recursive call returns, I need to multiply by a value of 10, so I need to remember how many 10s I need to multiply, right? So I'm gonna push the 10 onto a stack, right? Every time we push a 10 onto the stack, we know that a recursive call has finished, so I can subtract one from n. Right? And so when this is done, you end up with n 10s on a stack somewhere. 
Okay, so we have to remember there's a base case somewhere, right? And so the base case uh, basically says that the answer is one, right? So the base case, we start out uh, by setting, well, the answer is one. Okay. okay, and now we have to simulate what happens every time the method returns, right? Every time the method returns, we're gonna multiply by, a power, uh, by the value 10, right? How many tens do we need to multiply by? Well, there's a bunch of tens on this stack here. Right, so pop the stack until it's empty, multiplying the values as you go. Okay. So while the stack is not empty, pop the stack, right. that takes a 10 off the stack, you multiply it into the result, and you store the result back in result. Right, and that basically multiplies 10 n times. So that's a very convoluted way of writing a little loop that multiplies 10 by n, uh, uh, multiplies 10 n times, right? Um, so again, first of all, you'd never write this method recursively. Second of all, you would never convert it into an iterative uh, method this way, right? Uh, but that illustrates how you might uh, convert a recursive method uh, using a stack, right? The details here uh, will change depending on the problem you're trying to solve, right? But the idea always is make a stack, make your own stack, right? Whatever information you need to remember, push it onto the stack. Right, whatever you need to do with the information uh, after each recursive call uh, returns, you pop the stack and do something with that piece of information. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the obvious way to solve the problem, right? But that doesn't help you sol uh, solve a recursive problem in general. Oh, yeah, yeah, so while loop, so sure, you could write a, yes, you could write a for loop, right? Because you know there's, um, you know how, you can ask the stack how many uh, elements on the stack. Yeah. Can I clarify? Sorry, run that by me again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we start with one, right? So our result is one. Right? And then inside the loop, uh, we're popping the stack, right? So inside the loop, so imagine the loop runs three times. So result one times pop the stack, so it's 10, right? Next time through the loop. Uh, so we know that's 10, right? So multiply by 10 again, you pop the stack, right? Next time through the loop, 100 times 10, and so on and so on and so on. Right, you're literally multiplying 10 n times. That's all it's doing, right? <laughs> That's all it is doing. All right. So using a stack in the previous example, I mean, it's silly to do this, right? But it illustrates the basic idea of using a stack to convert a recursive method to an iterative method. Is there another, oh, this says there's another example. There's not, uh, but you can make up more examples here. Um, they get, uh, in general, it's not as easy as what I just showed you how to do, right? The principle is the same, but figuring out exactly what information you need to store on the stack and how to uh, manipulate that information uh, becomes quite a bit harder. Um, you might see more of this in your data structures course. Okay, so remember how our a list version of the stack works, right? Uh, when you push an element onto the stack, it looks like adding an element to the end of the list. Uh, when you pop an element off the stack, it looks like removing the last element from the list, right? Uh, and so instead of using a list, uh, you could implement a stack using a plain old array. Now remember what the limitation of arrays are in the Java language, right? Arrays always have a fixed size, right? Uh, furthermore, uh, so they always have a fixed size. So if you make array size five, they always have five elements in it, right? We want our stack to have a variable number of elements, right? It might have fewer than five, it might have more than five. So if you wanted more than five, uh, it looks like we're stuck, right? Our array can only hold five elements, but you can always make a bigger array, copy the elements from the old array into the new array, uh, and then use that array as your uh, storage for your stack, right? To deal with the case where you have a smaller number of elements than the size of your array, you can simply remember how many elements are in the stack, right? And then not use the extra elements in the array. So to do this, uh, using an array, basically we need to keep track of which element of the array represents the current top of the stack, 
or equivalently, how many elements are in the array. Okay, so here's our, I'm gonna make a stack of int using an array to store the values. So I'm gonna call the class int stack for now. Uh, we're gonna use an array internally to hold the elements. So I have a variable ARR, that is an array of int. Um, its default capacity will be 16. So when we make a new, brand new stack, we're gonna make an array of size 16. We're gonna remember what uh, where is the top element of the stack in the array, right? Remember, we're adding the element to the end of the array each time. Uh, so we're, you know, we're gonna start with a top index of minus one, which is not a valid index, but that indicates to us that the stack is empty. Okay. So to make an empty stack, we need a constructor, right? What does a constructor do? The constructor always sets the value of its field, of the object's field, so we make a new array of that, of that size. Right. So new int, int stack default capacity. Uh, we have an empty stack, so we set the top index to minus one in this case. Right. Remember, that's the index of the element that represents the top of the stack. Okay, so there's your picture of a brand new empty array in Java. Right, so in Java, when you make a new array, all the elements get set to zero. Right, our top index is minus one. Right, no elements in the stack. Okay, to push a value onto the stack, assuming you have space in the array, right, all you have to do, right, so when I push an element onto the stack, I wanna start filling in the stack at element zero. Right? So all I do is add one to top index. Right, so top index becomes zero and then I simply set the array at the top index. Right, so if I push a seven onto the stack, right, we add one to top index, so top index becomes zero. Right, I set the element of the array at index zero to the element that we pushed onto the stack, right, so it's seven. You push minus five, add one to top index, so it becomes one. Right, go into index one of the array, set the value to minus five. Okay, what about popping a value from the stack? So the blue square always shows you where the top of the stack is, right? So to pop the value from the top of the stack, I need to return that value back to the caller, right? And then I need to move the top index down by one. But that's all easy to do, right? So to get the value sitting in the array at the current top index, right? Now decrease top index by one, and then return the value that we remembered in step one. For an array, if you're making a stack of primitive values, right, you don't care about overwriting the old top of stack, right? There's no reason for me to set this to zero or any other value, right? Because I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna remember where the top of the stack is anyway, so there's no point to overwriting that value. Right, so, uh, so to pop uh, the top of the stack, we're gonna return the minus five back to the caller we're gonna decrease top index by one, so it now becomes zero. Okay, so that's the implementation of pop in code. It's very straightforward, right? Grab the element at the current top of the stack, decrease the top index, right? Return the element that we remembered in the previous step. Of course, you can't pop an empty stack, right? How do we know if the stack is empty? Well, the top index is minus one, right? So if we have, uh, we have uh, we try to pop an empty stack. Um, in this case, we throw an exception. Right? Okay, so suppose you um, start to push a bunch more elements onto the stack, and we end up with a stack that has 15 elements in it. Our array has storage for 16 elements, right? So we're allowed to push in one more element onto the stack. Right? So this is the state of the stack. Once uh, you can safely do one more push, right? So our index is 14. The size of the array is 16. Right, so to push, right, we know we can safely push onto the stack as long as the top index right, is strictly less than the length of the array, minus one. Right? So in this case, strictly less than 15, right? One minus the length of the array. Right? So if that's the case, well, we can just add the element to the array. Right? So add one to the top index set the element at the top index to um, the pushed value. Okay, so now what happens if uh, this condition is not true? Right, so if that condition is not true, we know that the array is full. Right? Uh, so you have a couple of choices at this point. 
you can either, if you have a fixed size stack, uh, then you can simply refuse to push the element onto the stack. You can either throw an exception indicating the stack is full. Uh, you could change the return value here to Boolean and return false indicating that there's no more room in the array, uh, in the stack, sorry, right? Uh, but if you want a variable size stack, then what you need to do is you need to make a bigger array, copy the element from the old array into the new array, and then tell your ob stack object that it now has a new array. Right. So if you run out of capacity in the current array, you simply make a new array. Right. That's bigger than the existing array. Right. How much bigger? Uh, whatever. We're going to double the size of the array. Copy the old array into the new array, so it looks like we're gonna use a loop. Okay. Adjust our uh, field inside our stack object so that the uh, stack knows it has a new array. And then go ahead and just do the regular push the element onto the stack. Okay. Did I tell you about the capacity? Oh, uh, da, 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 da. right. Okay, so if we run out of space in the stack, make a new array. Right. We're gonna double the length of the existing array. So I'm gonna make a new array of int. Right, and its length will be the old array length times two. Right, so it turns out in this step here, um, you want to multiply the size of the array by a value that's greater than one. Right, you multiply by one, it's the same size. Right, multiply by less than one, it gets smaller. Right, so you want to multiply by a value that's greater than one. Right, what you don't want to do is you don't want to add one extra element, uh, one extra space in the array, or two extra spaces in the array. Right, or some constant number of spaces in the array. Right. If you add a constant number of spaces in the array and you analyze the complexity of push, uh, you'll realize that pushing an element onto the array now has worst case complexity of big O n squared. Right. It turns out that if you multiply the array by some value that's greater than one uh, and you analyze that complexity, then on average, the complexity of push becomes O1. Right, but that's a topic for probably 635, uh, 365, your algorithm choice. Right, so we're multiplying by two here. Uh, you'll have to take my word for it for the time being that this allows us to have an average case complexity of big O1, right, constant time. Okay, so we've made a bigger array. I have to copy the old elements into the uh, new array. So a little loop. It loops over the uh, existing original array. Right. For every element in the original array, we grab its value, copy it into the new array. Right. And then we tell the stack, you've now got a new array. Right. So this ARR now becomes new ARR. Right. And now we need to push the element, uh, the element onto the top of the stack. Uh, and so you can recursively call push in this case. Right. So when you recursively call push, I'll push once again, pushing the element onto the stack. We now fall into the, uh, this case up here, right? We've made a bigger array, so the top index is definitely less than uh, the length minus one, right? So we go ahead and adjust the top index and add the element to the array. Right? The else part guards the recursive call, so we don't recursively call ourselves again. Right? Okay. Uh, so all of this stuff here uh, turns out to be very common if you're working with arrays, right? So when you're using arrays uh, for some sort of storage and you need that storage to have a variable size, um, you're always doing this sort of thing, right? Every time you're adding something to the array, you're checking, is there space in the array? If not, resize and blah, 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 right? So it turns out that's common enough that the uh, creators of the language decided we should put a method in that does all this for you. And that's what arrays copy of does, right? So arrays copy of uh, will create a new copy of an existing array, copying the elements from the existing array into your new array for you. Okay. So all of this can be replaced with that. Okay. So arrays copy of makes a copy of this array, right? How big is the copy? Well, you tell it how big you want the copy to be. If this number is bigger than the, um, that array's length, then it simply copies all the elements of that array into the new array. If it's smaller than this array's length, it copies the first n elements, whatever this value is, 
of the existing array into your new array, and it throws out the rest of the elements in your existing array. Uh, and so that's much easier to do, right? And then go ahead and now tell the stack that it's got a new array, and that it needs to push an element uh, onto the stack still. Right, and so there's a stack-based array implementation. It's not that much, so it's harder to implement than using a, bit, a simple list, right? But that's because the list does all the stuff for you. Right, when you add something to an array-based list, it's effectively doing something like this, right? Uh, I guess something like this, followed by uh, this, right? So if you have an array-based list, it's gonna check, is there room in the array that the list is using to hold its elements? If there is, it just adds it to the end, right? If there isn't, it makes a new array, uh, copies the elements from the old array into the new array, uh, and then adds the elements to the end of the new array. Oh, okay, so there's an array-based list. Uh, any questions on how that works? Yeah. Sorry, hang on. Okay, so why are we using composition for? Okay, so I think you're getting confused with composition. Um, so what, number one, this is a, uh, so there's a few issues going on here. Okay, so number one, our stack is a composition of an array, right? So that, that's true. You know it's true because there's no method that ever returns ARR, right? So that variable ARR is never exposed outside of our class, right? No one has access to that. None of the methods return ARR. None of them take in an array and try to copy it uh, by setting this ARR equal something, right? So for sure, this is a composition of an array, right? Um, but uh, if you think of a stack as being a collection of elements, right? Here our elements are of type int, and so those are primitive values. So there is no, uh, there is no class relationship in this case, right? Our stack has no relationship to, uh, uh, there is no class called int, right? So there is no class relationship going on here as far as the elements are concerned. That changes um, if that is not an array of int. If it's an array of uh, something else, uh, some non-primitive type, then you uh, then there's a relationship between the stack and the element type. Okay. But this is a composition of an array. Right. Oh, uh, one more thing here. Um, so the worst case complexity uh, for push uh, is always O n, right? At some point, if you push enough elements onto the stack you run out of space in the array, right? Your array now has n elements in the stack, right? To make a new array and copy all the elements into the new array, that's an on operation, right? So worst case complexity of push is on, but you remember you only have to do this every time you need to resize the array, right? So if you multiply the size of the array by some value like two, right, you can show that on average, this works out to O1. So for example, um, you start out with a stack of 16 elements, right? You can push 16 elements onto the stack without ever having to resize the array. Right? Each one of those operations only involves an if statement and adjusting some variables, right? So 16 times, you get an O1 operation. When you push the 17th element, that's where your ON uh, operation occurs. Right, but then you can now push another 30 something, 31 or 32 elements onto the stack, sorry, another 16 elements onto the stack before you have to resize again, right? Uh, so you can show that on average that works out to O1. So the average case complexity for push is O1, but the worst case complexity is in fact ON. Sure you will, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely you will, or you could be. Uh, if you look at the old exams, they all ask you these things. Right. Still, I mean, it's still doing the same work, right? It still has to make a new array, it still has to copy the elements, right? So the bigger the array that you have to copy, the more time it's gonna take. Uh, 
I now have to, oh, here we go. All right, so I guess the question is, uh, so the same is true with the, the list-based stack, right? We used an array-based list in that class uh, when we used a list to implement the stack, right? It has the same problem. When you run out of space in the list to store the elements, it has to resize the underlying array. So with the list-based stack, its worst case complexity for push is also O-N. Everything else is O-1, right? Popping an element just removes an element from the end of the list or the array. So that's always O-1. So I guess the question now is, is can you guarantee uh, O-1 complexity for push? And the answer is yes. But you have to be a little bit more clever in how you implement the stack. Uh, and so this is where this uh, linked sequence of nodes business comes in. Okay, so as I just said, pop is always in O-1 for our current stack. Push, worst case complexity is in O-N because you have to resize the array. Uh, if I want guaranteed O1 complexity for the uh, push operation, uh, you have to change how you store your elements. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create this thing called a node, right? And many data structures uh, that represent a collection of stuff, you can implement using nodes, right? We're probably not gonna get the linked list this year. Well, we might, but I don't think we're gonna. Um, we might get the linked list this year. Uh, so if we do, you'll see another example of a data structure that uses a linked sequence of nodes. Uh, in Sys 235, you'll implement trees. You might have done some tree stuff in 203 or 204, I think. Um, I think. Uh, so uh, trees um, are often implemented using nodes. Well, I, yes, they're often implemented using nodes. There's these things called graphs. Sometimes you talk about these in your uh, Sys 235 course or your math courses. There's an entire math course um, in the math department that talks about graphs. Uh, in your algorithms course, uh, you'll, you may or may not see a little bit of them. Right? Um, so these node-based structures, uh, they exist, they're very common in computer science. Okay, so what the heck's a node? Well, a node is something that stores some data. Uh, so in general, a node stores an element. Right? So it actually stores the element in Java if you have primitive type elements. So if you have an int or a double or a float, right? we're gonna actually store that value in the node itself. If you have a, a node that wants to store an object, it doesn't store the object, it stores a reference for the object. Okay. And then the node also stores one, uh, one or more other pieces of information, right? Uh, for our case, we're going to store a link to the next node in the sequence, right? In a tree, you would store a link to, you would store one, zero or more links to however many nodes are below uh, the node in the tree. Uh, so these nodes, these other nodes, uh, are, are these references to these other nodes are often called nodes. So in a stack, it's just a linear collection of elements, right? There's a top element, then there's a, the element underneath it, then there's the element underneath it, and so on and so on and so on, right? So the elements are arranged in a sequence starting from the top element, right? Every element connected to the next element. Right? So in our case, a node for a stack is going to store an element or a reference to an element, and it's going to store a reference to the next node deeper in the stack. Right. So here's a picture of a node right there. Okay. So conceptually, we're gonna store the element in the node. This is a string, right? We're not actually gonna store the string object in the node, we're gonna store a reference to the string. Right. This stack has one element on the stack, one string on the stack. Right. So the next element in the sequence well, there is no next element in the sequence. Uh, and so we're gonna store the value null for the next node in the sequence. Right, so that A there, that's your element, right? The uh, arrow and the value null in this case is the link, right? So when you push an element onto the stack, I wanna push a B onto the stack. What do we need to do in this link, uh, in this sequence of nodes? Well, I need to make another node, right? Because I need to store another element. So we make another element, uh, we make a new node, right? And we store the value B, or you store a reference to the string B in the node, right? So now what do you wanna do? I wanna hook this node up to the A, right? I know what node this is, right? I'm gonna keep track of where the current top node is. So I'm gonna have a reference top that points at or refers to the current top node, right? So I can now make that node's link point at A. So I can set the link of the new node to point at the current top node, right? 
And then, of course, I'm going to adjust top. Like that. Right? And if you're keeping track of how many elements are in the stack, you'll add one to the size of the stack. Like that. Right. Okay, so let's push another node onto the top of the stack. So I'm going to push a C onto the top of the stack. Right? Make a new node. Hook that node up to the current top of the stack. And then adjust the top uh, reference to now point at the new node. So how does, it, how does popping work? Well, to pop the element off the stack, I need to return the C back to the caller. So I'm going to go into the node, get the element from the node. I'm going to remember what that is. Right. So obtain a reference to the element stored in the node, in the top node. So that's going to be the C. I'm going to remember there's a C in the top node. Right. I'm now going to adjust top so that it points at the next node in the sequence. Now you might ask, how do I get to the next node in the sequence? Well, you just follow the link. Right? So top next is going to be the node B. Right? And so I'm going to this top, so it now points at the new uh, top node of the, uh, the next node deeper in the stack. And then I want to sever that link right there. Right? Uh, so conceptually, you want to sever this link. Right? Uh, but it turns out in Java, you don't have to. So the way this is going to work in Java is that uh, once I adjust top so that it points at the second uh, node in the sequence, no one is going to have a reference to this node anymore. Right? So as soon as an object has no references to it, that object disappears from memory or can disappear from memory. Right? So when this node disappears, its link also disappears. Uh, so we don't actually have to sever the sequence here um, uh, ourselves. Conceptually, that node disappears, right? You now subtract one from the size of the stack, and you now have a stack of size two. Right? And of course, you return the A back to the caller. Uh, sorry, the C back to the caller. All right, so how is this going to work? So every node uh, needs a link to the next node in the sequence. Right? So in Java, what you do is you make a node class, one of its fields is a reference to another node. Uh, so here's an example of an association relationship where a class has an association relationship with itself. Right? Every node has a field of type node that represents the next node in the sequence. Right? We're going to call that link next. Right? So every node has a link to the next node. Right? For a stack of strings, every node is going to store a reference to one string. Right? This is association here, right? Uh, it's not aggre uh, sorry, this is aggregation, not association. This is aggregation because the string does not have a reference back to the node. Right? So that's a strictly one-way relationship there. Right? And that, uh, this link, this, uh, sorry, the string is going to represent the element that we're storing in our stack. Okay, so how do you implement this thing? So it's not that hard to implement. So we're, we're going to make a class called link stack. Right? We have an interface for stacks, so we might as well use the interface. Right? So we're going to implement the stack interface. We're going to keep track of how many elements are in the stack. You don't have to do this, but it's convenient. And we're going to keep track of what is the top node in the stack. Right? So we have a uh, field of type node that always points at the top node of the stack. Okay, so we now need our node class somewhere. Right? And so where are we gonna put our node class? We're gonna put the node class inside the link stack class. Right? So this is similar to how we implemented the um, range iterator in the range class. Right? We define the range iterator class inside of range. Here I'm defining node inside of link stack. Um, but there's an important difference. Right? Uh, notice that node is marked as being static. Right? Range iterator was not a static uh, nested class. Right? The keyword static was not there. So what's a static member class? Right? So this is the simplest kind of nested class that you can have in Java. Right? What exactly is it? It's just a regular class that happens to be defined inside of another class. So in other words, this class node is just another class, right? There's nothing special about it. 
Oh, I guess we should talk about what's inside of a node. So inside of a node, there is a uh, reference to a string. We're calling it elem. And there's a reference to the next node in the sequence. We're just calling it next. Right? Here I've left the um, access type uh, as package private. You can make it private here. There's no, um, there's no problem making it private. Um, it makes it a little inconvenient uh, if you are debugging or testing because you can't get access to this uh, field directly. The constructor simply sets uh, this elem to the string uh, elem, and it simply sets this next to the node next. Okay, so our node class is a static member class or a static nested class. They both mean the same thing. Right? It's just an ordinary class that happens to be inside of another class. Right? Now remember, uh, range iterator was an inner class. Right? So inner classes have access to the field of the class that are the, they were defined in. So range iterator had access to the fields of range. That's not true with a static nested class. Right? So a static member class does not have access to the private members of the enclosing class. So a node cannot see the private fields of linked stack. So any individual node has no idea how many elements are in the stack. Right? Similarly, any individual node does not know what the top node of the stack is. Okay, so uh, for an inner class, right, uh, objects of the inner class can only exist if there's also an object of the enclosing class. Right? So a range iterator only exists if there's a range. That's not true for static member classes. You can have a node that exists without a stack. Right? So node objects can exist without belonging to any linked stack object. That's important because we're going to need to make a bunch of nodes. Right? And we're, we're not going to want to make, uh, we're not going to want to say, hey, this node belongs to this stack every time. All right, so how does the constructor work? Okay, so our constructor sets the size of the stack to zero, no elements in the stack, and it sets this dot top to null, right? And this is new, we haven't done this before, right? Uh, so why does it set this top to null, right? So the question is, uh, so what? So why are we setting it to null? So you could um, make a new node if you really wanted to, right? So you could call the node constructor, right? The question is, is what the heck do you pass in for the elements for an empty stack, right? No, I don't know, right? What do you push in for next for an empty stack? So for next, you're definitely gonna pass in null. There is no, there is no next element, right? But we want the case for the empty stack that there be no top node. Or conceptually, you want there to be no top node. Right. So here we're gonna set it to null. We're not gonna call a node constructor here. Right. For the size, we're keeping track of the size of the stack, so I can simply return this dot size. Right. How does pushing an element onto the stack work? Well, I'm gonna make a new node. Right. That's easy, you just call the node constructor. So there's our new node B. I want to set the node's next link so that it points at the old top, the current top node. That's also easy, right? We have, we can access the, the next field in the node, right? And we can make it point at or refer to the current top node because we also know what that is. Right? The stack knows what top is so it can easily move, uh, adjust top so that it's equal to the top node. Right, and of course the stack knows how big it is, so it can always add one to itself, uh, to its own size. So push is trivial, right? Make a new node. We're gonna store the element in the node, so this makes, so here we're gonna call the constructor to store the element for us, right? And instead of uh, setting the link manually ourselves, I'm gonna ask the constructor to say that this new node, its next element is the current top node of the stack. So that takes care of steps one and two. Uh, one and two, yeah, one and two, that's right. One and two, one and, yes, one and two, right? So steps one and two, you just ask the node constructor to do that for us. Set top to refer to the new node. Okay, this top equals n, right? N's our new node. Add one to the size, sure. This size, this size plus plus, and you're done, right? No need to resize an array, no need to check if there's space in the stack. 
None of that. Right? Make a new node, set its link, adjust the top uh, adjust the top reference, and adjust the size. And away you go. Push is now in 01. How do you pop an element off the top of the stack? Well, it's similar, right? Grab the element in the top of the node, in the top node, right? So that's this dot top dot elem. Right? Set top to refer to the next node deeper in the stack. Okay, this dot top equals this dot top dot next, right? So this top points at this node here, right? So this top dot next is this link here which is just a reference to the next node D, right? So that does that. Subtract one from the size, okay, this size minus minus, right? Return the reference uh, to the uh, element that was stored in the old, in the old node, uh, no problem, right? So grab a reference to the current element stored in the top node, to the element stored in the current top node. So the current top node is this dot top. Its element is just elem. So I'm gonna remember what that string is, right? Make top point at the new top node. So the new top node is this dot top dot next, right? That's the next node in the sequence, right? So I can just write this top equals this top, not, uh, this dot top dot next, right? Subtract one from the size, okay, right? Return the popped element, sure, return popped. Right? Do a little bit of error checking, Right, if the stack is empty, well, I can't pop an empty stack. Right. Uh, and that's it. So pop is also in 01, right? All we're doing is we're assigning one, two, three variables and returning a value, right? So there's nothing there that depends on the size of the stack. Uh, so that was, I mean, once you get your head wrapped around the fact that every node has a reference to another node or the next node, um, this sort of stuff, uh, it should be obvious how these methods are being implemented. All right, um, now with an array or with a list, if for some reason you wanted to look at every element in the stack, um, it's easy, right? You just loop over the array or the list. Uh, but now we have a linked sequence of nodes. And so there's no way that I can just go to the middle uh, node um, in one step. So if I want to iterate over a sequence of nodes, uh, and this turns out to be a very common operation when you're working with these linked sequences, um, the idea is, is you start at one node and you just follow the links to get to the next node. Right? So observe at the end of the sequence, we know where the end of the sequence is, right? You eventually end up at a node that's null. So you simply start at some node in the sequence, you just follow the next link to get to the next node, Eventually you hit a null node and you know you're done, right? So if you want to iterate over a sequence of nodes, it's always the same pattern, right? You make a little node variable n. Now remember, this is a reference to a node, right? It's not the node object itself. Um, so you make a reference to a node, right? And you pick whatever node you want to start from. Usually in a stack, you're going to start at the top node, right? Now remember, in an empty stack, the top node is null. So you don't want to do anything. You don't want the loop to run if the stack is empty. So as long as the node you have is not null, do whatever you want to with the node n inside the loop. Right? At the end of the loop, go to the next node. Right? So n equals n dot next sets n so that it now refers to the next node in the sequence. Right? Don't forget, when you exit the loop at the bottom here, right, you exited the loop when n was null. So whatever you do, don't try, to don't try to use n here for something, right? If you do, you'll get a null pointer exception, right? N's not valid after this, uh, n does not have a valid reference once this loop is over. Right, so start at the top node, there's an n, right? Is n null? No, it points at a node. Okay, do something with n. And then follow it the next link, right? So that moves us to the next node. Right. Is n null? No, it points at a node. So do something with this node, follow the next link. Right. Is n null? No, it points at the, uh, this node here. Do something with this node, follow the link. Oh, n's now null, we're done. Right. And that's it. Right. So if I want to generate the string representation of a stack, 
I have to follow the sequence of nodes, right? I want the first, the top element, then the second element, then the third element, and then the bottom element, right? So start at the top of the stack. Here I'm using String Builder. You can just use um, String if you want to here um, for the purposes of this course. String Builder is the mutable version of String in Java. Right, so start at the top node, as long as the node n is not null, right, I've got an element in the stack. So I'm going to append a new line character to the uh, string, then I'm going to append the string representation of the element, and then I'm going to go to the next node in the sequence. Right? If there's another node, I'm going to append a new line character followed by the string representation of the element, and so on and so on and so forth. Right? Eventually we get to the end of the, we get to the last node, process the last node, and then I can return the string representation of the string builder, um, and that gives you your return string. Oh wait, we're out of time. I have to uh, stop there and uh, we'll finish this uh, lecture off in the next class.